Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. Well, if you're in ministry, and I know many of our listeners are either on a paid staff, a part-time staff, or maybe you volunteer an immense amount of time at your church. Let me first talk about the time that your pastors spend. It's, I heard a church one time being critical of a pastor for not spending the right amount of office hours. And they were like, man, he needs to be there from eight to five, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, wow. So when they get called to the hospital at, from nine to midnight, or they got to do a funeral on Saturday, where do they trade off that time? I, I just don't think we realize how precious the time of our ministers are and how much they're on call. But I want to shift that to our ministers. If we do understand the demands on time, how much time do you spend developing a teaching Maybe a lesson you're going to deliver on a Wednesday night or to a small group versus how much time do you develop people themselves? Josh, Mm. how, Josh, Marion, how do you balance coaching ministry leaders on that item? Because we're called to develop people, not develop content when we talk about teaching, you know, now we got to develop sermons. Don't get me wrong, but what, what's your take on this? It's a balance, uh, you know, that you have to have um, some guardrails and the administration and the planning uh, takes care of those. But I think, you know, if you're doing it right, I I used to tell my student team, you know, effective student ministry is not done within the confines of this office. You need to go where the people are. Jesus said, go and make disciples, not get everybody to come to you so you can do it. Like, you know, that's like one of the things we, we spend so much time trying to attract people to come to see what we're doing here versus going out to where they're already doing lives at the basketball games, at you know, school events, whatever it might be, and just making yourself available and going out into their world. I think you're right, Josh, in that there's a balance. I think when I'm investing in other leaders, I have to really lean in and listen to how they're wired because I do think we each have a bent. Some of us are more relational. So what can happen with my personality oftentimes is I can really zone in on the relational piece and not tend to the administrative piece. Or there are some, like my husband, who is extremely gifted in the administrative piece, and he can be stuck behind his desk crunching numbers and handling executive pastor type things and have to make sure it's on his calendar to invest relationally into those around him. So I do think it it comes down to the individual person, and I do think there's a balance between the two. So where your bent is, You've got to know that about yourself. There's got to be some awareness. You need wise people pointing that out in your life to go, hey, you are really good. Like I have a mentor who's she's great at saying you are so good relationally. That is your gifting. And she doesn't ever want to take away from that. But she's like, but at the same time, part of your leadership role, you have to tend to some administrative things. You've got to sit and prep. You've got to sit and gather. You've got you've got to spend the time. So does that make sense where there's there's you need wise people in your life to help you see where you tend to lean? Because I do think we all lean in one way or another. Ron, which one would you lean more towards? Oh, man. You know, being an introvert, I have to force myself out into certain settings. 
I, I don't mind. I, so I love prep. I love reading. I love the research. Now, I also love one-on-one, though. Sure. I don't sure. love one-on-four, you know, one-on-five. But I don't mind teaching, you know, 25 or 2,500. There, right. there, so I'm, I'm kind of weird in that. But you mentioned we need some, some wise direction. And I, I want to tell our audience, Tim and Cindy Hawks have figured this out. And they've yeah. proven it in their ministry. They have been part of building a very healthy church. Uh, super, super healthy because they challenge people to do what Marianne's just done with me. Which one do we lean towards? Which one do we default? And is it the correct one? And you're going to hear Cindy talk about courageous parenting. And Tim's going to talk about how do we get to courageous parenting by emphasizing the discipleship component that's outside of church. I think it's going to be an eye opener. And I hope we catch the paradigm shift. I hope we catch the hey, let's look at it from a different angle perspective that they're going to push our buttons on in an uncomfortable way. So let's listen to Tim and Cindy. We'll come back and digest it. Introducing D6 Everyday Foundations, strengthening the building blocks of faith. We are thrilled to announce the launch of D6 Everyday Foundations, a groundbreaking curriculum designed to empower churches and families in their journey of faith. This innovative program aims to align the church and home, fostering a strong foundation and unshakable confidence in God's Word. D6 Everyday Foundations boasts a comprehensive three-year scope, focusing on major themes and characters from the Bible while also addressing pertinent cultural issues. With this curriculum, we aim to equip individuals of all ages to stand firm in their faith and navigate the challenges of our ever-changing world. At the heart of D6 Everyday Foundations is a church and home partnership, recognizing the vital role both play in nurturing and cultivating a vibrant faith. Through this collaboration, families will be empowered to prioritize and emphasize God's Word in their daily lives. Together, Let's lay the foundation for a generation grounded in truth and empowered to impact the world around them. Let's hold the building blocks of faith firmly in place. To order D6 Everyday Foundations and embark on this exciting journey of faith, visit d6family.com today. Today's guests are Tim and Cindy Hawks. Tim was the lead pastor at Hill Country Bible Church in Austin, Texas for 35 years. He just recently, this fall, uh, passed that off, and so Mm -hmm. that's wonderful. He's married to his wife, Cindy, and they have five grown children and six grandkids. Cindy leads in a variety of ministry areas, teaching, discipling, and mentoring women, passing to them what God has taught her about his word, his love, his purposes, and his heart for people. They have been married for 40 years, y'all. It is so good to have you today. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're going to be talking about courageous parenting today, which, Cindy, I know is obviously a passion of yours and Tim, man. It's great to have you along uh, in that journey with her as well. I think uh, in thinking about Big C Church, Mm -hmm. we take some great strides now, I think, uh, in saying, hey, parents, you need to disciple your kids, right? Like we're doing a much better job than we have in previous generations. Um, But I think at the same time, we're forgetting those same parents need to be discipled in the first place. Am I right in that? Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. You can't pass along something that you don't have. And obviously, Jesus' form of discipleship was he passed himself along to his disciples. And Paul even said, follow me as I follow Christ. So discipleship is inherently relational and parenting is relational Mm. and so whatever the parents have through relationship they're going to pass on to their kids Mm -hmm. and so if they've been thoroughly discipled by the consumer culture and that's kind of how the family is making decisions about money and about time and priorities and entertainment um, turning to your children and saying hey but there's another way it's the way of jesus 
doesn't do that much. In fact, it actually can inoculate kids against following Jesus. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you bring that up because everyone is being discipled to something. something. Yes. Right? That's Why correct. then is the church not doing a good job? Like, <laughs> it seems obvious, right? Like, <laughs> you can't pass something on that you don't have. You can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah. And so why is the church not doing this? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I I don't know. I think we're, we're <laughs> easily, easily distracted. I know for us yeah. in our journey... Uh, continually returning to the Word of God and the the call of Scripture to make disciples and to to introduce people into a relationship with Jesus and then help them follow Him in obedience. Mm -hmm. That's the core command. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's easy for us to lose, you know, have mission drift to lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. But returning to that and uh, refreshing that to me is the the answer. I, when you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the sociologist Christian Smith and how he, in his research, has said that the most important thing in passing on faith to the next generation is the authentic relationship that the parents have with in their walk with God. Um, so it is really essential. Um, and it's the command of the Scripture. So God yeah. knew what he was doing. So what, what do our churches need to make sure that we have? Like, how can we make sure that parents have a place where they're encouraged and supported and strengthened and discipled? Well, it, it's really a paradigm shift for most churches because the average, really the, the normal model today in the church is an agreement in a busy world between the church and the church attender that the church will ask for a couple things, and if people provide those things, we're all good. And so in the average church, it's attend on Sunday morning and tithe, be part of a small group, and spend some time serving in the church. Mm -hmm. And many people are being inadvertently taught that that's kind that's of it. your Christian thing. Right. Like if you do those things, you're okay with Jesus, life is great, now go become successful, make money, have fun, do stuff with your kids, like live out that life. And um, in many cases, that becomes kind of a system in the church and it kind of feeds the beast of making things go well. And then the church focuses primarily on preaching and Sunday morning and pulling off whatever the church does and fails to see that really the call of Jesus is a personal call on people who need to incarnate his plan into their lives, which takes place outside of those structures and, and so forth. And so in many ways, the church today has to be re-envisioned to a discipleship approach that actually is person-to-person -person relationship involved outside of the programming, which is going to require a different paradigm. And so that's that's part of where we're at right now. Yeah. We can't yeah. keep doing what we're doing and expecting something's going to change. We've got to change what we're doing, and that's a tall order for a pastor who's been trained and taught, preach the word, pull off a great worship service, get people involved, and everything's going to be good. Yeah, yeah. thinking about the, the church as a whole um, and the role, of, well, for us, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the importance of incarnational leadership, that we're actually living out what we're calling people to be, that means that that we in, in church leadership, I mean, bigger than the lead pastor, but certainly um, the leaders in the church, lay leaders and staff, um, are actually doing that. So we're actually discipling people. We're, you know, for us, a paradigm that we think about is, is um, building into people the core identities of worshiper, witness, servant, disciple maker. That's who we are. And this is how it plays out in the patterns of our lives. So we're, you know, we have small groups of disciples that we're investing in. Mm -hmm. And part of the conversation in those kind of situations, especially with young, young moms that I might be discipling is how are we passing that on to our kids? So it's a natural part of how are we doing life? Um, 
But that's a bigger thing when we start talking about um, parents and how to encourage them. It's and such an all-consuming thing, I think, creating communities where parents are being discipled as parents, mm -hmm. and then the conversation flows into how do we pass this on to our kids? How do we, at what stages and ages do we help them start practicing walking with Jesus mm -hmm. and knowing Jesus? Uh, um, I think the community aspect becomes even more important. Yeah. Having a practical conversation about discipleship and parenting. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Did you know that because of D6 Heroes, Randall House and D6 Family are able to equip families far and wide in the area of generational discipleship? Due to the financial gifts of both individuals and churches, D6 curriculum has been translated into multiple languages and distributed across the globe, including restricted access countries for use in the underground church. In short, because of the financial gifts of individuals like you, moms and dads all over the world can pass their faith to the next generation of believers. Would you consider becoming a D6 hero? A D6 hero is an individual who invests their financial resources in the ministry of Randall House and D6 family to ensure that believers can transfer their faith through the church and home. Please visit d6hero.com to join the ranks of our heroes and to explore other areas where your financial investment can have an impact. All right, Tim and Cindy, so what about the church leader who is listening? And they're like, okay, well... I understand that the definition of insanity is continuing to do the same thing and expecting different results. So if we do want to have that paradigm shift where we are actually discipling people who then ultimately are turning to disciple people. So that could be in a small group, but ultimately here we are talking about parents yeah. who hopefully we're discipling the parents who are then turning to mm -hmm. disciple their kids. Mm -hmm. What does that look like practically? Like, what's what does that lead pastor's first step or that discipleship pastor's first step or even a lay leader who's like, okay, I'm going to be part of this change. What is their first step? Where do they go? So, so for me, one of the things I do when I'm talking to pastors is really focus in on what Jesus said. So of all the things that Jesus could have said, he only said one thing. And that is go make, go make disciples. disciples yeah. And oftentimes, you know, I've been personally guilty of focusing on the macro. Mm -hmm. How do we reach a city with the gospel? How do we saturate the city with church planting? Like the big things and missed focusing on the, the micro. Mm -hmm. And the micro, making disciples who make disciples who make disciples, actually will accomplish the macro. Mm -hmm. But if you try to do the macro without doing the micro, it doesn't accomplish either. So I tell pastors, if, you'll, if you're willing to block out three hours a week, get a group of people and spend a year investing in them and invest in them in a way where they now own their faith, they've made these decisions, they have a commitment, they have life patterns and habits that are discipleship patterns and habits, and they can turn around and take a few people and do the same thing with them who then become disciple makers and do the same thing with them. You may never pastor a church bigger than 100 people who show up to listen to you preach, but in heaven, you'll literally have hundreds of thousands of people from the generational movement that you're starting by just carving out three hours a week to really pour your life into other people. So I think for many pastors, it's just saying, I don't know how to do all this, but I know what to do. I'm going to carve out some of my week, and I'm going to pour into a group of people to become disciple makers mm -hmm. and then unleash them. And if I do that every year, I'll have more population in heaven disciples of Jesus than if I pastored the largest megachurch in the world. Mm -hmm. And if that's the beginning point, I think the rest of this just starts to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's my encouragement. Just make that your first priority. 
Yeah. Cindy, I would love to ask about courageous parenting yeah. because as we're thinking about making these disciples and discipling mm-hmm. these moms and dads, I mean, we're, we're parenting in a time that other parents through generations have not experienced right. what we are it's a whole and new what we're world. parenting through, yeah. right? So how can we equip parents for themselves to stand strong yeah. in their faith, but also to equip them to equip their kids yeah. to do yeah. that too? Yeah, well, that's what we're hoping in what we're doing with Courageous Parenting, um, just acknowledging we're in a, a different situation now in our culture and in the U.S. at least, but I think across the world um, and what parents are facing in the environment they're raising their kids in. So courageous parenting, our hope is, is that we've taken these discipleship, this kind of discipleship mentality and approach and um, integrated it into a community of parents that there's a large group that we've gathered of, of young parents um, so they feel like that they're not alone, where they can um, come together in a larger group. So we're talking at this point for us is like 200, 250 um, parents coming together where they can be encouraged and see each other, but that's not the only thing. Then they're in small groups, and the the DNA of the small groups is, is to think about life transformation for the parents and for them to see the things that we're looking at, these what we call courageous choices that we think have a disproportionate influence on families flourishing and the next generation embracing the faith, that, that as they're making those courageous choices, a lot of times parents focus on like, what, how, what, what should I be doing to fix my kids mm-hmm. and helping them like, no, first, let's make those courageous choices for ourselves. Let's apply those things to ourselves. And so in our small groups, what, we're, what we've tried to do is have mentor leaders that are older gen like that have been th- have the humility that comes with experience mm-hmm. and the wisdom that comes from experience and people that are committed to the word of god and committed to discipleship as they're leading these groups they understand the relational discipleship part and are challenging the parents and will even slow down the group mm-hmm. to like let's let's get this into our lives incarnationally and then here's some practical things that we can do to pass on to our kids. So we're yeah. trying to do a both and. Yeah, um, I love that. The parents are growing and they're investing in their kids. Yeah. I, I have a lady in our church who she asked to have lunch with me a few months ago. <laughs> and uh, she's a friend to not just, you know, someone who attends our church. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, she said, Casey, I just, I really feel like the Lord wants me to start a mom's group, not a Bible study. Mm-hmm. This is a mom's group where there can be mentor moms there with kids who are still in the home, who maybe mm-hmm. are a season ahead. There's some that are a season behind or two or three, um, but just to to have a place where you can come and eat a hot meal that you didn't cook Mm -hmm. and you you don't have to clean up and that you can just share what's going on in your life and be encouraged Mm -hmm. by other people. And I'm like, yes, Yes. how can I resource (laughs) you? You know, like really? Yeah. And I mean, when she said that, I just had goosebumps head to toe. And I'm like, this is what it's about is like living life together. But I love the fact that what you call this is courageous parenting because it takes courage to parent in a different way than everyone else. Right. Yes. Our parenting should look different. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, we've identified what we call these four courageous choices that we think with where culture's going, that, that there's so much rub that it feels really countercultural yeah. to choose and it some should. of these. Yes. It yes. should. Yes. yes. And because it's so countercultural or courageous, we feel like the community is even more important. Yep. So that parent, it's so weird in our world where we're so connected and everyone feels like they are really connected with people around through social media. They're very disconnected yes. and lonely. So I feel like yes. I'm the only one. And I'm also gathering information, information everywhere at my fingertips. But then I have to pick and choose what's right. And I, might do what's right in my own eyes, which usually doesn't work out mm-hmm. instead yeah. of going to the mm-hmm. Word of God. Anyway, Let's look at the book of Judges, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Identifying these courageous choices that um, then we help each other make those. Um, 
and they're, and they're hard. But, I mean, those choices that we think are, are exceptionally important, the first one is direct their spiritual formation, which is basically what Deuteronomy 6 teaches, that we take responsibility for the spiritual formation, the spiritual growth um, of our children. So that's kind of the foundational one. The, the following three uh, steer their education. That, and it's, it's choosing schooling and overseeing that, but it's bigger than that. It's the shaping of their minds that I'm engaged and know what's going on and yep. keeping up so that I can be involved in the shaping of my child's mind and keeping up and know what's going on is a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and to think through it in a biblical context, because according to the studies that are coming out from the center of, uh, of biblical worldview, there's only a small percentage of Americans that have a biblical worldview. Right. So like I have to have that grid and then I have to be able to, in an open, honest, relaxed way, invite my children into the conversation about what we're seeing going on. Yeah. Uh, the third choice is guide their media habits, which is screens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a courageous choice from the beginning yeah. because parents feel like they need to, I've got to give my two-year-old an iPad. Well, it messes with their neurological pathways. Or then when you get into teenagers, like I'm going against all the pressure yeah. of mm -hmm. society. And the last one is nurture their sexual wholeness, mm -hmm. which is... It's the beauty of God's design for sex and relationships, but it's it's also our identity as male and female and the beauty of that. Um, and then having the discussions about the messages that our culture is sending and being able to love the people in our culture, but also stand distinctly different. Yeah. And I, our parents are on a journey because most parents of children 10 and younger are in the millennial stage, so they've... Um, they've been hearing the cultural messages and been just swimming in that. So they have, like, I've got to make a mind shift myself mm -hmm. as I'm helping my kids that's look true. at things yeah, differently. That's yeah, that's true. Tim, can you talk a little bit about the pastor's role in this? Um, you know, how does the, the leadership impact what's happening in the body of the church in this regard? I think that the pastor has to see that the cultural obstacles that would hold their people back are not going to be overcome by simply doing a sermon series on technology or it, it uh, courageous choices require people to have conversations, to be with peers, to be challenged, to have time to process. And that takes place outside of a Sunday morning content um, it, it, it can be reinforced that way. So in some ways, being willing to look at developing structures that support that level of interaction, discipleship, involvement, and then also to um, really begin to push back on parents that you don't outsource spiritual growth to the church. Like mm -hmm. we're not here to take care of your kids' spiritual needs. We're here to support you yeah. in you doing that. And many churches are willing to kind of say to people, hey, we're a one-stop shop, come give us a little bit of your time and we'll do it all for you. But it takes the insight of a pastor to be able to deflect that mm -hmm. and then lead with a vision for transformation that is not comfortable, cost everything. Mm -hmm. and, and so part of the discipleship in courageous parenting is making choices. You know, Jesus said, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me, which is a choice. Mm -hmm. And so each of these courageous choices forces a discipleship choice on the parents mm -hmm. because they can't make this choice for their kids without making this choice for themselves. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about the 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 pastor's role for us the the courageous parenting and and uh helping our parents lead the next generation to faith. For our life passion has been gospel saturation, that every man, woman, and child in, in our area and then our, our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth would have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Um, so 
as a pastor, and th- you're asked to do so many things, and uh, you have so many opportunities, sometimes it's hard to prioritize, or you just can't get there. And I think it's interesting kind of how you've looked at your life calling of gospel saturation and how that informed your investment, your presence in courageous parenting um, events and teaching and um, because of the gospel saturation perspective. Absolutely. We, we cannot continue to lose our kids and reach our country. Mm-hmm. We just can't do that. I mean, the, the numbers are in. If we, if we lose another generation, if Gen Z goes the way of where we're seeing in the church right now, we will be a post-Christian nation. We're approaching that now. And part of the conviction that I had is if we're not sowing into the youngest and keeping our own children, if we're not transforming families, we we lose. Yeah. I mean, we lose. So pastors who have a heart for evangelism can't see family discipleship as a distraction from wanting to see this country reach with the gospel. They have to see that as an investment in seeing this country reached with the gospel. So I started taking my focus away from what can I and my generation do to change the world and started recognizing if I'm not thinking a couple generations below me and pouring into them, we're not going to do this. And recognizing in humility that we are not on this planet for this moment to reach the world. We're on this planet to participate in the plan of God to reach the world. And I have a part to play as a pastor. And it's not the whole part, but it better be the most strategic part or I'm going to miss the whole thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You guys, this has been such a great conversation. We could continue Mm -hmm. on and on and on. Hopefully, this is your first time at D6, but hopefully it's not your last. We would love to have you back and continue this conversation. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, Check out the resources with Courageous Parenting. And uh, thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. My very favorite, my very favorite uh, moment here was when she talked about incarnational leadership and just living out what we're called to do and be, but taking that a step further and thinking about the the ways that I'm mentoring other women in my life is, is they said that one component of that is that we build Christ identity markers into others. Mm-hmm. And I I love that. Like it's making me kind of emotional just thinking about it. Like I want to be that kind of world changer that the, the, the people that God has called me to do life with, I want to be someone who is building Christ identity markers into others. That is really a beautiful way to fight culture and to fight darkness (laughs) is to speak those, those, those identity markers, those Christ identity markers into other people. And I w- thank you for that nugget of truth for me. That's on a post-it note mm-hmm. sitting in front of my desk. Like I'd speak that into my boys and that I speak that into the women that I'm, I'm pouring into that I would speak Christ identity markers into others. You know, that's the paradigm shift that he was talking about in churches that it's moving to, you know, from that consumerism to re-envisioning the church's approach to discipleship to person to person, face to face, just like you said, and we all want to go where everybody knows our name. You know, <laughs> yeah. and it can it can be one of those things that, you know, you can have all the lights and the wonderful worship and great teaching, but if your church is to a point where people can remain uh, anonymous moving in and out, that is not the 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 church and that's not what Christ designed it to be. And I think that they are like, they were right when they said, you know, it's inherently relational and parenting is relational. It's all relational. Jesus was relational. Discipleship is about relationship. Yeah. Ron, I would love to know, I I heard this interview and I thought I would love to know Ron's thoughts on this one. When he talked about the macro and the micro, I I feel like that is so Ron Hunter. Yeah. I would love for you to like dissect his, the focus on, we get so focused on the macro that we miss the micro. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah. That's the same saying. It's, it's, it's a, People go, man, I don't get that. It's the same thing as, can we see the forest for the trees? It's the same exact item. 
And we do, we can, we get so caught up on one item. And the question that I think we have in that focus is, is the one item we focus on something we learn from how we've always seen it done? Mm. Or are we learning from what actually works or maybe the new paradigm of the research? Like we've heard from so many of our guests, like, are we including multi-generational, intergenerational? Are we including people who are not biologically related to influence? So can we see a bigger picture before yeah. we zoom in and get so focused on that one part? It's it's that it's that five guys holding on to a different part of the elephant and one feels a different experience. And yet we back up and we're just, oh, this is an elephant versus it's a trunk or it's a, an ivory tusk or it's a, a tree a trunk that actually turns into the elephant's leg. Mm -hmm. I, I wish we could step back and see bigger picture and then zero back in on our specific ministry. That's I probably confused it and muddied it more than it was worth. But no, that's good. That's it. That's how my mind deals with that one. So I love I love it. The point that it's sobering and I think it's a wake up call for the church. You know, um I think there's a D6 video somewhere that says, you know, the church has never been more equipped to reach this next generation, yet they are fleeting, you know, and, and he says, you know, if, if Gen, Gen Z goes the way we're seeing in the church right now, there's a chance that we could become a post-Christian nation. And I think that, you know, like I said, that could scare people, but I think it just means it's time for us to rise up mm -hmm. and it's time yeah. for us to, to, to make the difference and not be uh, scared, but invest in a way that, that children own their faith because we all know that once somebody experiences God, they experience discipleship, they experience him and, and the Holy Spirit, that a person with an experience is never at the mercy of someone with an argument when they move out into the world. Well right. said. Some would argue we are currently at a post-Christian world. And even if we are, the cool part is God has a redeeming remnant and he may be looking at you to redeem that moment and be firm in Babylon or in Sodom or wherever you're landing. So I appreciate Tim and Cindy and, again, their wisdom. Next week, I'm super, super excited about the conversation with J.J. Jones. He's a veteran youth pastor moved towards family ministry. And I will say that he and about three or four others are having some conversations that we're going to feature in 2026. We're already planning two years away, 2026, to feature some of the things that you're going to be introduced to, such as church as family, and moving past the equipping the parents to engaging the entire adult population to lean into intergenerational ministry. So I want you to make an appointment to catch next week's episode with JJ Jones. We're praying for you and we're asking you that you will always take what you've heard here and make a difference in the lives of those around you. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.